Greetings. I brought you sunny weather from Florida all week. It usually leaves with me, so uh, glad I could help you guys out with that. Um, they're just finishing a little technical swap here to get the presentation going. Um, let me start with a couple things. Who has heard or is very familiar with Kubernetes? Very familiar. A few hands. Okay, we'll call it 10, 15. Moderately familiar. Okay. Kubernetes is brand new and you have no clue what it is. No confessors of that. All right. Um, well, uh, I'll just do my intro since we're here. So I'm Jeremy Oki. I'm the VP of Sales Engineering at SpectroCloud. Um, we're a Silicon Valley startup. Uh, you know, been, this is not our first trip around the startup world. I've been in sort of the cloud, cloud native, you know, virtual machines, now Kubernetes space for over a decade. Um, and so developing products, meeting customers' needs, and getting them uh, innovations at a fast pace. So let me see how we're doing. Are we good? We're not good? Okay. This is where I do a little dance. <clears throat> just talk a bit about, I'm trying to remember the slides here, so at least we can just skip through a few of them. Um, I am going to be talking about a reference customer we have, um, GE Healthcare. Um, if any, we're, we're at KubeCon. The, there's twice a year the CNCF. Um, so if you want to learn more about Kubernetes, there's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So years ago, as Kubernetes got going, Google sort of pushed it off and funded the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that's the open source group that's building the ecosystem around Kubernetes, because a lot of this is open source, and the CNCF shepherds a lot of product, uh, projects um, from sandbox to, uh, to incubation to finally graduated. So there's sort of different stages of the innovation, and Kubernetes itself is graduated. There's quite a few other key uh, components that are graduated as well. So that's why you're seeing Kubernetes now is ready for production use. Um, there's a lot of ecosystem around it, and uh, the CNCF sort of shepherds it. So the KubeCon event is twice a year. They just had it in Valencia. Um, and the next one is in the U.S., so it goes back and forth between uh, uh, Europe and the U.S. So if you want to jump ahead two slides, because you already have heard about me. Yep. So we've been doing this for a little while. Uh, we've been in the Kubernetes space for over five years. So you know, listening to customers, trying to ship even other products, commercial products are starting to ship on top of Kubernetes. So not only is it custom development and open source, it's also becoming commercial off-the-shelf software. So as a, as a customer who may think I don't have custom development, pretty soon you'll have software you buy that says, oh, by the way, I need a Kubernetes cluster to run on. So the customers are starting to be pushed into providing these Kubernetes platforms. Um, few accolades, you know, a top hybrid cloud, a hot startup, uh, recently Google, uh, a Gartner cool vendor for 2022 for Edge. Next, please. So in talking about GE um, healthcare, you know, Edge is, is powerful. It's where the customers are. It's more and more, it's where the applications are. Uh, it's where the data is. So a lot of times we're actually stuck with pushing our applications to the Edge because that's just where the data is. It's just too much data being generated and too much customer interaction to be able to um, bring the applications back like we used to, to the cloud or to central data centers. And so for someone like uh, a healthcare provider, uh, they obviously have things like the machinery, uh, scans and such, those are at the edge and they're generating lots of data. The patient is there. As we move applications to the edge, they also become more expensive to maintain out there. The technologists that run them aren't there. Um, what's another challenge? Um, regulatory domains, you're actually in the regulatory domains, like for healthcare, the FDA, like in the US, for example, you have to go through certain approvals. So changing out the applications or changing the technology can be difficult. And so this is creating a lot of the, of the challenges. There's also just the scale is bigger. We'll talk a lot about that. So retail stores, you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of retail stores. We're not just managing a handful of server racks, we're managing thousands of devices out at the edge. So they're far away from the smart people, and there's a lot more of them that are under management. So the old ways of doing things with people just doesn't won't scale for this. Next, please. So, it's not difficult, um, but we do have some challenges. Unreliable connectivity. A lot of times, these edge environments can be transient. 
Uh, the, the, the internet connections can go down. They're not as robust as we have in data centers. Uh, they may be the 5G connectivity is spotty, or that area doesn't even have 5G yet. We're pushing 5G applications, and some places don't quite have that kind of throughput. We're also finding that these may be customer locations. Like in GE Healthcare's example, their equipment is in their customers' hospitals. They do not have full control of the environment. They cannot specify this will be, you know, this server on this configuration with this connectivity. Um, the, the hospital may say, you know, we're not connected to the internet. We don't allow that. We use a different vendor server. Or our IT people aren't as great as the other customers' IT people. That happens too. So those are some of the challenges we have with the edge locations. Next. This is the CNCF landscape. So if you go to l.cncf.io, so when you look at what does it take to get into production, one, it takes usually 10 or 20 of these tiles to get a Kubernetes stack into production. This doesn't even include your applications or your ISV's applications that you run. This is just the ecosystem of things. Some of these are great ideas that aren't gonna make it. Some of these are, are still, are, are graduated. If you actually filter this, I think graduated, there's maybe 20 tiles that are graduated. You'll also find there's opinions. One developer team, one software product team may have an opinion that the right way to do it is a few of these tiles on the left. Another team may few, uh, view that it's a few tiles on the right is the right way to do it. So ultimately, offering the ability to run any of these in, in, in many combinations is really what is required when you have large, diverse ecosystems of apps and developers. Next. So the ecosystem is changing quite a bit. Um, from a technology perspective, the operating systems, they are new, um, they are smaller, they are lightweight, they have less attack surfaces, there's new vendors you may have never heard of, like a flat car Linux that those guys were actually acquired by Microsoft about six months ago. Um, the Kubernetes itself, the, the heavier, bigger Kubernetes we run in the cloud and in the data centers is actually being replaced by a lighter weight version that can run on smaller devices. Um, if I told you you could run Raspberry Pi, about that big, uh, I could run a point of sale system at the edge on a Raspberry Pi, would you believe me? We're not quite there, but close. We're getting where many applications can actually run on small devices. So these, the edge devices we think of also are becoming much smaller, and how do you manage those? And then all these sort of, I, these projects, many of these, I think all of these listed pretty much are all open source. There's also not in many cases a commercial vendor who's giving you support. Friday night at 2 a.m. when it's broken, who is the vendor who's actually going to, who you're going to call to remediate the problem? Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. There's a few of these that have support, but many of these don't have an enterprise support option. Okay? So really the problem, take GE for example, they have an application stack. It runs in the cloud. It runs in their data centers. It also runs out at the edge on appliances. So do I want to have three different architectures for three different environments? No. So that's one of the first promises of Kubernetes. Um, virtual machines were supposed to be highly portable, and we could move them around. It turned out they were too big. The standardization wasn't there, it wasn't enough. Um, we had a few people that won. You know, VMware tends to be the ubiquitous person, but there was also OpenStack. Many of you in this space are, are very familiar with OpenStack. Its format was different. They just ended up not being as portable. So part of the challenge of, of, of virtual machines is, is just the size of them. So containers, microservices, and cloud native, you tend to hear these three things interchangeably because it's a new application pattern that promises some of the things we didn't get out of virtual machines and those first sort of iterations of cloud. Okay? But we don't want to run a different stack in each location. We'd like to have sort of a Kubernetes as a service stack that we can then just sort of tune uh, thinner for the edge devices and thicker for the clouds and the data centers. Next. So it's a complicated landscape that in the middle here is lots of different things. We're also finding on the right, for example, KVM. We're finding even though everything's containers in an ideal world, we still have some adjacencies to a few virtual machines. We have thousands of applications we need to pull into this. Okay, so we call those repositories. How do we bring all the, the binaries and configurations out to the edge in these repositories is one challenge. Um, we need to support internally developed, open source, commercial, et cetera. So the implementation has to support many different options. 
We need a consistent solution for all of them, and it's got to be lightweight. So in the architecture, we have to accomplish all these things. It's not like the old days where I could just stick in a CD, boot up a system, and now it was configured with a little bit of extra work. We have lots of little different things that stream in and make up the configuration in Kubernetes. Okay, next. So let's talk a bit about GE's specific requirements that, that, that they've accomplished. Um, one, the devices are smaller. Um, they tend to often be also single nodes. You know, we think of a lot of times resiliency and redundancy. We do that through many nodes and geodiversity and synchronization. A lot of those things don't, don't exist at the edge. We may only have actually a single device. Can we still get a conf software configuration that's highly available, though, even though it's a single device? Well, the answer is yes. If you could then swap that single device very quickly, maybe 15 minutes of downtime, and still have the software be upgradable and rolling upgrades and highly resilient, would that be acceptable? For a lot of businesses, that is. Um, so this having a, a small, low-touch uh, appliance is something we work at GE to do. You're also needing to upgrade this over the air, similar to how your cell phone, your, your provider sends you patches monthly. That's very different from how IT traditionally works, but on Kubernetes and an edge configuration that's done right, we can actually push things like the operating system, the Kubernetes, and all these layers you start to stack up that make up the solution all have different timings of upgrades. They have different interdependencies, and you need to be able to push them over the wire because out at the edge you might have a retail manager who we're glad they can turn their computer on and log in successfully every day. We're not going to expect them to actually troubleshoot networking and Kubernetes issues. Um, and we also have to mirror the, 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 all these artifacts, let's call them. The binaries, the configurations, these are the artifacts. We have to get them out to the site. So the stack also usually has to have a configuration that pushes them out. In GE's case, for example, they have hospitals that are dark. They have no internet connectivity. Or it's intermittent, where the sync might happen overnight when it's uh, more data throughput, and then during the day, they're disconnected. So how do they do those upgrades during that time? Uh, click again. So we have thousands of locations. You also have a lot of existing tooling that you're already dealing with. So this has to integrate with existing tooling. Uh, and what that typically means is not using a UI for everything, having APIs available, or having common configuration integrations such as Terraform and Ansible. So we provide that as well. Um, so that's sort of what you like approach. Our, our Terraform, a lot of things in IT are being done with this thing called Terraform from HashiCorp. Um, I think we have 3.4 million downloads to that, that these days of our Terraform provider that we offer. So customers that are already have adopted Terraform as their way to do infrastructure as code, meaning highly automatable, uh, via code that can be used over and over and over. That's what the Terraform provider is for. Next. So you need to have optionality, but you also have to have someone to call. So for example, you know, setting up out of the date that we offer 24-7 support. When it's a lot of open source, who do you call when it's this networking component and your, your technical folks may not have a troubleshooting experience? So being connected in the ecosystem, contributing to it, um, customers are contributing to this ecosystem as well, so it's actually very collaborative. We as a company are, are supporting the ecosystem. We are pushing code back and doing open source projects in the community, but your customers and partners are also doing that. Okay? So that's part of the why you see so many tiles in that landscape, and there are sort of new tiles popping up every day. It also has to be sort of out of the box easy to use. So having the ability to, to visually stack up the desired outcome in an easy way that's visually obvious is, is part of what a good edge product needs to do. Next. And scale. Our number one problem in Kubernetes in the past has been scale. Prior generation architectures, they really were built for what we called mega clusters back at the time. So you might hear of a customer that has, for example, Red Hat OpenShift. They're running a thousand nodes in one cluster and they treat that cluster very delicately, it runs for years, and, and it's very slow to innovate because there's so many people using it, you have to consider everyone involved. We're finding now the trend is to move to many clusters instead of mega clusters. Some of these clusters are still big. You might think they're mega, but they're for maybe one use case. So they have a very specific version designed for a very specific use case and still can be very large, like, for example, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning. You may have hundreds of nodes that make up a cluster, doing a machine learning activity, but it's still now a single purpose cluster, so organizations are ending up with many of those. Edge is following that many pattern as well, where we're ending up with not just hundreds, thousands of clusters, and they're running, maybe I have one or two clusters at each edge location. 
Okay? So the ability to manage these at scale is one of the things that was sort of lacking in the, in the Kubernetes world. Um, even just a few years ago, there wasn't even, they call it fleet management, where you're managing many containers and many clusters. So some products created later a fleet manager, but it was sort of an afterthought. It wasn't really part of their architecture. So you, you'll read some stories where people are starting to do edge deployments to retail. They're getting to a couple hundred stores and then realizing that the prior generation platform just can't handle that. It just wasn't designed for that, and they're, they're struggling a bit. So one of the ways that this happens that the vendors solve for it is they end up putting in multiple management control points. And that might be great if you have, well, I have a management control point in Germany, I have one that covers the EU, I have one that covers the Brexit area, I have one for North America, but even then you can still end up with, with tens of thousands of clusters. So you really need one management point that can manage all of it. Um, and so we do that. Next. Um, so let's talk about the workflow. I mean, ultimately, it, you want to be able to, to have a device that's just simple to connect. The software stack is easy to understand. It's easy to deploy. It has sort of built-in ability to synchronize all the artifacts that come to it. And then it has telemetry that comes back that tells you if it's healthy. OK, next. Um, so what does that sort of look like? The, in the middle is actually visually what it looks like in our product. So you have what we call a blueprint, a cluster profile. And this is sort of unique in the industry as well. A lot of times, the configuration is built for one environment, and you can't really offer it as a service. Many of us have catalogs where people can even come self-serve and ask for this blueprint, what we call a cluster profile, and then have it be deployed to many devices. Also, ideally, you'd want to update the blueprint. Hey, the layer three has versioned from one to two all the other things to the right that were derived from that blueprint, we should see that they have an upgrade available and then push those upgrades out. Okay, so the ability to have a central blueprint that, that manages many deployments is, is pretty critical. And this is really, this is what GE's actual full stack looks like. I showed you more of some technical and open source projects that only made up the bottom half, logging, monitoring, operating systems, management, et cetera. The upper half actually gets into the industry and application specific requirements. So this stack will end up looking very, very big and very complicated pretty quickly. Uh, we're also finding that, that this is more and more being pushed to bare metal. Let's remove the virtualization layer that was VMs because that's just one more layer we have to troubleshoot. So this is actually running on bare metal, on bare metal in the data center, on bare metal on an edge appliance. There isn't a traditional virtualization hypervisor any longer in these uh, architectures. Next. So how do we sort of make the workflow easier? Uh, many of you are probably involved with partners who actually do sort of factory or warehouse integration. So this is what GE wanted specifically. Hey, we order a certain server. We sell our customer, you know, small, medium, large, extra large appliances. We ship it configured. So the first step is let's have it factory integrated. It's ready to go from the initial baseline blueprint, and then we ship it out to the location. And many, there's partners even here today, that's a big part of their business, is configuring and shipping. Now, at the edge location, oftentimes what we were doing in the past is we, it was a truck roll. And many of the times we have like a minimum four hour contractual obligation. So a truck roll, even for something simple, can become very expensive. What if it was as simple as powering this on, taking your phone, and it comes up and shows a QR code on the device, or uh, in other cases, we have RFID tags on top of the device, and you put your phone over it. This could be the retail store manager. Just puts a phone over it and either takes the QR code and just finishes the configuration automatically. No technical person involved. That device has now come across the cloud and registered and said, I'm back online from where I factory integrated. And they finish the configuration, associate it, and do any sort of additional deployments or updates that are required. So this was very specifically a, a challenge GE had struggled with. They had a lot of higher touch configurations. They had to send a field engineer. Oftentimes they said it was taking upwards of eight hours to get an initial deployment up online. And now we can do it in just a matter of minutes. Okay, so the, use, the uh, journey to start deploying thousands of edge locations is much simpler um, in this kind of architecture. Next. Um, let's see if anything we haven't talked about already. In a disconnected case, sometimes you get where, how do I push updates out? Highly confidential classified environments, you have to walk things across the gap. Or there's intermittent connectivity, you have to push a store update and the store is just not uh, connected for some reason. So we do have the ability in these edge devices to have a local 
command line interface or even a, a local web UI so that if you could take a, a USB drive, hey, for this air-gapped environment, just if you can just download this small update configuration bundle to a USB drive, plug it into the Edge device, even if it's not connected, it's still being managed by the central location. You're just taking and walking the updates across the gap. We're seeing this also in things like intelligence or cyber, where maybe a team disappears out in the field for a long time. They still may need to bring in, introduce custom tooling, their own tooling, or take an update periodically, and they're doing it in an environment that's not connected. So they're doing that by walking something across the gap on like a USB stick and then using the local web UI on the Edge device to at least bring it back up to a version uh, update. Next. So just to sort of summarize, what should a modern Kubernetes look like? Um, by the way, you will see Kubernetes spelled for those that's new, K8S. Uh, you'll see sort of lightweight versions called K3S, sort of half of an eight. Uh, whoever thought of that thought they were very clever. Um, but we need lightweight. A lot of times the devices are smaller. Um, the price point of them is much lower. We're not really treating them as, as assets as much as we would in a data center. If they sort of get lost or wander off, we still may need to do things like encrypt the data at rest because they're under a manager's desk. There might be three of them. But we tend to, rather than fixing them, we just have a spare on the shelf. We ship them a new one overnight. They plug it in, and, and the environment's back up. So a lot of times these are not N plus one and highly redundant. They are an N. It might be a single device and at least the software configuration is highly redundant on it. But the device itself, it may not be worth having the device be redundant. We just ship them another one. Um, thousands of nodes, you need a lot of flexibility. The stack has to have a lot of interchangeability. The developers need to know that, well, if I prefer tool B versus tool A, that you can offer that to them. And they really don't need to know about a lot of what goes on underneath below that. Uh, but can you also give them, developers oftentimes want to deploy a copy of it. Maybe it's in the cloud or in their environment. Can you offer the platform as a service where they can self-ask for the blueprint, deploy it maybe to a cloud-based cluster, test their application, and then say, yep, it works. So we're shipping version two, this artifact into the repository, and now that's what gets pushed out to all the edge devices. So we see a lot of times that that's what the third-party developers are asking for, is the ability to deploy a cluster just in the cloud and do some testing just like if it was the edge device. Okay, next. I think we've talked about quite a few of these, but the landscape is evolving quickly. These open source projects come and go fast. They move very fast. I think a lot of times what we're trying to make sure that customers and developers have access to is the latest innovation without the platform stalling them out. If someone comes to you and says, I just want to be able to try this new project, can you give them an environment quickly and let them go add to it and try out new things that maybe aren't blessed? This is very common for developers now to try to stack new things on top of what might be your standard environment. Um, and so the edge isn't just possible, it's inevitable. We're seeing it with the, with the connectivity, with the small device scale, um, and the innovations in Kubernetes that people are really pushing the envelope and coming up with great, new, exciting ideas. Uh, so next slide, just a couple closing things for you. Um, one more. So at CNCF, if you want to actually hear the GE story, back one. The GE story is published by CNCF, uh, so actually I think there was 15 minutes where one of their architects was actually talking about it, what they're doing and how they're doing it, et cetera. And uh, we're out there at the booth as well. If you want to come talk to us, tell us about your use cases and we'll see how we can help you out. So appreciate it. Hope you guys have a great event. Thank you.